Hello and welcome to a new episode of Germany in Focus, a news podcast made possible by members of The Local. Today we're talking about the latest strikes in Germany and how they might affect you. We're discussing how long Germans typically live and why life expectancy is falling. After a group of hikers were questioned by German police, we'll talk about border checks here and heightened tensions following the outbreak of the Middle East War. Under Germany's new immigration law, family reunification rules are being eased, but only for future non-EU skilled workers. We'll hear from someone affected who wants to bring an aging parent to Germany. Finally, we're going to chat about some of the most surprising taxes that exist here. I'm Rachel Oxen, and I'm in Berlin today with journalists Aaron Burnett and Rachel Stern. Hello. Hey, Rach. Hello. How's it going? Uh, we're hanging in there, I think. It's <laughs> November in Berlin. Yeah, it just turned really cold, so I'm getting those wintry vibes. But soon, you know, the Christmas markets will start and it'll be a bit more charming. I'm so looking forward to this, obviously. We know that. But you, uh, Rach, had a very typical um, November North American experience. You have two North Americans in the booth with you today, I so know. you're outnumbered. So we we want to hear about <laughs> this. A very typical North American experience in Frankfurt recently, didn't you? I did. Thank you for asking. I have to tell you about my NFL experience. So I went to Frankfurt on Sunday and I saw the Indianapolis Colts <laughs> beat the New England Patriots. So the Colts won. Mm -hmm. um, so this was part of the NFL's games in Germany. And it was an amazing atmosphere. There was lots of singing, which I enjoyed. We did Country Roads, Take Me Home, which apparently is a German favorite. The Germans love that song. They do. Yeah, <laughs> I've heard it. I'm afraid on karaoke nights. <laughs> Often sung by by Germans, Germans who but want not the, you. <laughs> not me. No, definitely not. Yeah, it was really great. There were cheerleaders. There was such a good vibe. I was invited by the Visit Indie organization from Indianapolis, and they were so lovely. They gave me a scarf, actually, which I'm going to show you guys. Oh wow. oh, wow. Yeah, it's blue and white for the Colts. It has the Frankfurt Games... <laughs> Uh, it's special made scarf. For, are you a Colts fan now? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm basically American now. <laughs> Welcome to the club. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah, we just have to. I'm North American. <laughs> yeah, but it was so funny because they did the American and German national anthems before the game and everyone was standing up. The Bundeswehr, the German army were, were on the pitch rolling out the flag. It was quite emotional. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe yeah. I had too much beer. I don't yeah, know. <laughs> well, it's a bit unusual in Germany to, to wave out the flag. Um, a lot is becoming more common in, in recent years, especially when it comes to sporting events. You know, you'll certainly see it on World Cups of football, not American football or just Football, as Rachel and I call it. Yeah, but anyway, soccer. <laughs> yeah the, 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 the constant football confusion. Yeah, and how does it feel, Rachel, to see NFL being played, such an American thing being played in Germany? Well, I've never been a big fan of American football, but I think it's cool that it's coming football. to this side. Yeah, just football, as I <laughs> tend to think of it still, over on this side of the Atlantic. It's nice that, you know, Germans are also getting so animated and it would be fun maybe to check out a game one of these days just to get a little, quote unquote, taste of home. Mm -hmm. I used to go to football games with my dad a bunch Aww. and we would end up cheering for different teams because, you know, he was from Saskatchewan and I had to support Calgary. So, <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting to to see it come here, uh, given uh, the tradition that it holds at home. Definitely. And there are actually millions of NFL fans in Germany. I wrote a story about it, so I'll include it in the show notes if you want to check it out. I interviewed the NFL Deutschland guy, yeah. manager guy. <laughs> There's more fans, I think, than you'd expect. I remember uh, an old roommate of mine um, when I first got to Germany, we stayed up to watch the Super Bowl and there was a he hosted a big party. Mm -hmm. I was a bit surprised to to see how popular it was. I was mostly staying around for the Madonna um, performance at the halftime show in 2012, were. but it was still uh, fun nonetheless yeah. and, and why very not? popular. <laughs> That's yeah. the best part of exactly. the Super Bowl. Yeah. 
Okay, before we get into it, I'd love to ask if you can hit follow, leave a review and a rating wherever you get your podcast. This helps other people find us. So it's really, really helpful and much appreciated. And if you do fancy supporting the podcast and our work, you can become a member of The Local. You can find a link to a special offer for podcast listeners in the show notes, or you can access it directly at thelocal.de slash podcast offer. Okay, let's get into what's been in the news. It is strike season once again. Regular listeners will know that we talk about strikes in Germany quite a lot. It's a normal part of life here. They're not quite as widespread as in France, but still the unions do have power here, especially when negotiating pay increases for workers. So we have some public service strikes going on in Germany right now. Plus, there are strikes affecting trains this week, and there could be more on the way even in the festive season. Rachel, can you tell us about the latest strikes? What are they? Where are they? And who's affected? Sure, Rach. So public service workers organized by the union Verdi are going to be striking through the end of next week in all of Germany's 16 states, but particularly in Hamburg, Schleswig-Holstein and Berlin. And basically state-run companies, schools, kitas, district offices, in some cases even job centers are going to see all of these walkouts. So obviously parents with younger children will be affected by a lot of these school closures um, and kita closures as well. People who have surgeries, um, especially non-essential surgeries, might see those rescheduled due to hospital closures. Anybody who has a bureaucratic appointment might also see those appointments canceled or rescheduled. And so if you fall into any of these categories, it's a good idea to double check, still very up in the air if the demands are going to be met or not, hence the strike. What are the unions fighting for for employees? So the service sector's union is demanding a 10.5% raise in income or a minimum wage increase of 500 euros more per month. And they're also asking that trainees should be paid 200 euros more monthly. And previously, the bosses have just said that they cannot afford a pay raise of this amount, um, even in light of the higher inflation. Rachel, we had a train strike called at short notice this week. Can you tell us what's going on there and what to expect? Sure, Rach. So the GDL Train Drivers Union announced that their members are going to be striking from 10 p.m. Wednesday, so the day we're doing this recording, um, to 6 p.m. on Thursday. So that means that by the time listeners hear this, those strikes will most likely be over. And they're also demanding higher salaries as well as improved working conditions. And it seems that these strikes are going to affect all of the services offered by Deutsche Bahn. So ICE trains, regional trains, and also the S-Bahn of most cities. And so you might remember that earlier this year, there were all sorts of transport strikes from another union, EVG, which was kind of the umbrella organization of a lot of transport companies in Germany. And luckily, um, their demands were met and that kind of came or it it meant that there was uh, the end of strikes for the time being. But it seems like the current strikes could still continue and stretch on until the Christmas holidays if demands aren't met. Okay, thanks, Rachel. We'll definitely keep an eye on that and keep you updated on that. Moving on, we had some interesting figures that came out this week talking about life expectancy in Germany. Aaron, can you tell us how long are Germans living on average and how does this compare to other countries? So according to the latest Eurostat numbers, Germans are living to the average of 80.8 eight years of age, so Mm -hmm. just under 81, with women, of course, living uh, slightly longer on average than men. If we look at Germany against other EU countries, plus Iceland and Switzerland, that is a pretty average number. It's better than the number that we see in the Baltic countries, in Poland, Croatia, and Hungary, where the average person is expected to live only until into their mid-70s, or even Bulgaria and Romania, 
where life expectancy only gets into the early 70s, so basically 71 and 72. But Germany is behind Austria, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, the Nordic countries, France, the Netherlands, Belgium, Italy, and the top performer, which is Switzerland. People in Switzerland can expect to live until almost 84. Oh, that's quite a big difference. Yes, it is. Why is life expectancy going down in Germany? Because I believe that is a, a, a trend, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. It is. It has fallen. Uh, and Health Minister Karl Lauterbach called that decline unacceptable and offered up the reason that we're better at treatment than prevention in this country. Cardiovascular disease is a big culprit, uh, according to Lauterbach. So heart attacks and stroke. Uh, and preventing that is really more about encouraging healthier lifestyle than treatment, um, which is what I think he has his uh, finger on there when he makes that statement. Uh, experts have actually said for a long time that the Mediterranean diet eaten in Southern Europe or in Southern European countries is best for heart health. So things like uh, lots of legumes and vegetables and tomatoes yeah. and uh, those kinds of things, uh, pasta. And some of those countries actually, according to these numbers, have the highest life expectancies in Europe. What are some of the regional differences in how long Germans live? Well, regionally, there's some interesting numbers here, too. Now, the top performing city or region anywhere in Europe is actually Madrid, Spain. Really? Yeah. So, um, you know, that's uh, that kind of maybe a testament to that Mediterranean diet that we were talking about just now. Average life expectancy there is above 85, but a few German cities and regions are no slouch. It may surprise you, but Berlin actually does decently well here. We're looking at 78.3 years for men and 83.8 for women in the capital. Otherwise, the areas with longer life expectancy in Germany tend to be further south. Tübingen or Upper Bavaria, where Munich is, uh, Oberbayern. Uh, are the only regions in the country where men have an average life expectancy of over 80. Yeah, uh, we see life expectancy for women also higher the further south you go. In general, eastern German states have the lowest life expectancy in Germany, with Saxony-Anhalt performing the worst. We see 75.4 years for men and 82.1 for women there in terms of life expectancy. Big exception, though, to the eastern German rule is women in Dresden. They're living long. They're living almost as long as their Bavarian and Baden-Württemberg counterparts. Uh, 83.8 years. That's the highest number recorded outside of the two southern Bundesländer of Baden-Württemberg and Bavaria. Super interesting. What do you both think are some of the factors that result in people in Germany living longer? And what do you think are some of the risk factors that might cut down life expectancy? Well, it seems like the more mountainous areas like by the Alps tend to have people living longer. And it's interesting because of cities in the U.S., those that are very high up at high altitudes also tend to have long life expectancies. Yeah. And the other interesting thing is, is that if you look at a, at a wider European picture, if we look just uh, over the border into Austria, has a life expectancy slightly higher than Germany's, uh, 81.3 years. But the highest life expectancies there as well are also um, the regions that are in the Alps. So th places like Tyrol, or Salzburg is where we see the highest numbers there. That could be down to a number of things. The Alps may very well encourage a healthier lifestyle or a more active lifestyle if you have the mountains right there that you can just go and hike through and yeah. enjoy. Right. But we also see that those are also the regions in both countries that are just a little bit richer or even a lot richer in certain cases. And ultimately, um, healthier foods often cost more. Right. And that's yeah. something we're certainly seeing really in focus right now um, with higher cost of living and regions with fewer services. So eastern Germany um, famously has a lot fewer services also in terms of uh, doctors and they have life expectancy. So you know, there are tons of different factors might be at play here. But we also have to say that these numbers are taken from 2021. So uh, that was the height of the pandemic. And we may or may not be seeing some trends that might not necessarily be normal in other years either. So uh, yeah. it will be interesting to see how this plays out in the next few years. Yeah, definitely. And, I, and I'm also surprised a little bit about Berlin because... As we both know, Berlin's smoking culture <laughs> is quite a big thing here. And I guess drinking drugs is also quite a big thing, at least 
in part is for some people who live here. So I would have guessed that this kind of lifestyle might had an impact. And yet Berlin and Hamburg t- tend to be better in terms of expectancy outside of those uh, southern regions. Mm-hmm. Um, they're they're right. not the highest, but they you know we're doing okay in this in in this uh, in this town. Mm-hmm. Um, but those those two southern Bundesländer are absolutely killing the rest of us. <laughs> like, That's where we got to be yeah. in the mountains. <laughs> I'm all for it. Okay, let's get on to our next topic. Germany, as well as some neighboring countries, have been tightening up border controls recently because of a spike in irregular migration. But should you expect to be checked if you're going about your daily business near Germany's borders? That's what happened to a group of hikers last week who were questioned by police while they were out on a trip near a German border. Rachel, can you tell us what happened? Yeah, so a hiking club comprised mostly of Syrians from all over Germany met to go hiking in the beautiful Sächsische Schweiz, which is a area I still struggle to pronounce, um, located near the Czech border. But they were really shocked when after a day of hiking, they returned to their hostel and they found that police were there waiting for them. And somebody had reported them as potential illegal refugees. So one of the hikers, a dual Syrian-German journalist, wrote about her experience on X and the post went viral. And so our colleague Imogen reached out to a police spokesperson who told us that police, in light of more irregular immigration and smuggling, are simply carrying out more checks um, and that such a situation like this can be expected. But in this post on Twitter slash X, Um, It got a really mixed bag of reactions. One user from a refugee assistance agency saw the scenario as an example of racial profiling. And he wrote, even though you were probably able to clear things up, it shows how the poison of racism works. And other people, however, didn't see what the issue was. And they said that basically random checks are what keeps everybody safe. So As you can tell, it's kind of a tense atmosphere and this situation just highlighted that. Yeah, I think this story kind of sums up at the moment the general atmosphere in Germany with some politicians and some media arguably kind of stoking up fear around people with a migration background. We've seen a lot of public arguments in Germany in reaction to the Israel-Hamas war. And this is really dominating German society at the moment. As we talked about in the last two episodes, some Germans and others see supporting Palestine or calling for a ceasefire as anti-Semitism. So on that note, Arendt, can you tell us about uh, another story that many people on social media have been talking about regarding a call to remove the passport of a woman who came to Germany as a refugee and uh, recently posted a pro-Palestine slogan online. So Reem Sawil uh, originally came to Germany as a refugee and gained a lot of attention in 2015 for asking then-Chancellor Merkel a question at one of uh, Merkel's citizen dialogues. Uh, Her response uh, sent uh, Reem Sawil, the refugee girl in question, or she was a girl at the time, Mm -hmm. uh, into tears, and Merkel tried to give her a hug. It was an awkward-looking moment that gained national attention um, at the time. Now, Reem Sawil is Palestinian. She is originally born in Lebanon, but officially she was stateless until she was naturalized as a German last year. Recently, she posted on her Instagram, quote, from the river to the sea, hashtag free Palestine, which is the post that is becoming controversial in uh, German media. And the reason is because although it may appear as a benign phrase to some, although I think that there are some people who also use it, knowing that it's not a benign phrase and use it anyway. From the river to the sea refers to from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River, and it implicitly calls for the destruction of the Israeli state. And it is a favorite of Hamas, which is, of course, the terrorist group that rules the Gaza Strip and conducted the October 7th massacres of Israeli civilians. 
Numerous Jewish groups from all over the world say it is anti-Semitic hatred, uh, and yet people do still use it uh, on signs at protests, including here. Sometimes that may be because um, they're unaware of its significance or its meaning, and sometimes it is, in fact, intentional. I should note here, though, as well, that there are Israelis who've used it in the past. Um, in the right-wing Likud's party, 1977 Manifesto, that is, of course, the party that Israeli leader Benjamin Netanyahu leads at the moment, they actually actually used the the phrase in that manifesto. And they did so in order to say that they were committed to there being only one state, which is Israel, and there would be no Palestinian state. Hamas obviously uses it um, to advocate for one state, which, of course, uh, means the destruction of Israel. So whenever you see it used by either side, we're not looking at people who are calling for a two-state solution here for obvious reasons. Berlin, the city of Berlin, has banned its use, and neighboring Austria actually says that it will also ban the phrase. A Dutch court recently ruled that it should be protected speech. So it's the subject of a lot of debate in Europe more generally, certainly in Germany. And when Reem Sewill used it, uh, the Bild tabloid, which is the newspaper with the highest circulation in Europe, by the way, quoted a formal Merkel confidant as saying that her German passport should be revoked as punishment. That obviously would leave her stateless. The bottom line is, is that it is not a harmless expression, despite Reem Sewill posting it with a heart. She very likely knows this herself. But what consequences should there be for using it? That is the debate that we are currently having in Germany. Uh, and it's a very, very live one. And uh, revoking citizenship, particularly where there's not a con constitutional mechanism at the moment to do so, is the most extreme suggestion for a punishment I've heard. But again, we're talking about the phrase uh, being banned and it having potentially other consequences, including arrests or fines or what have you. Thank you, both. Okay, we're going to chat about the skilled worker immigration laws, and we'll focus on the part of the law that will see family reunification rules eased for future skilled workers coming to Germany. We're going to hear from a reader of the local who is affected by the changes soon. But first, let's recap on what this all is. Aaron, can you remind us about the changes for skilled workers coming to Germany and what the family reunion aspect means for people? So we're getting a host of streamlined processes for skilled non-EU workers coming to Germany. And we've talked about this plenty of times on Germany in Focus before. Yes, so have. have a look at our dedicated episodes for uh, some of that in a little bit more detail. Uh, really quickly includes a point system that would make it easier for people who don't speak German yet or may not have a degree in their field of work but have relevant work experience uh, to come to Germany to look for a job even without a firm job offer. An EU blue card will also be available to more people as part of these measures. There are also simplified family reunification rules, which will allow people to bring parents, for example, where maybe, you know, one parent has died and the other one is on their own and it, um, people wish to bring that parent uh, over. Um, however, these new rules only come into effect in March of next year, and they won't apply to people who came before that, leaving a lot of people who are already here and may want to bring family members in the lurch. Thanks, Aaron. Let's hear now from Bavesh Upal. He's 32 and came to Germany from Mumbai in India around eight years ago to do a master's. He now lives in Berlin with his wife and daughter who was born in Germany and works as a project manager here. I started off by asking Bavesh what he thinks about the law. Overall, the law is positive. It's a good step, but I think it is coming very late, especially if you compare to a lot of other developed countries uh, in the likes of USA, Canada, Australia, Singapore, who have implemented quite early on such laws, such immigration policies, and have been very successful. And immigrants have been driving their GDPs, uh, the family generations, since a very long time. So it is certainly positive. It is very slow. The major issue with the law that uh, I see is it's not uniform. I think one of the important things for a law to stand its ground is it should be uniform. It should be non-discriminatory. Uh, and to a certain sense, the new provision, which just allows skilled workers who obtain permit from 1st March 2024 onwards, 
and align them to bring their extended families, which is parents or in-laws, I don't personally see it as a law. I think it's, it's probably a political compromise. It raises a lot of questions in terms of how Germany in the future wants to address immigration topics, how much they want to market themselves out to, to prospective and, and also existing skilled workers in the country and, and make life better for them. So lastly, if you see people who might also take end up taking advantage of this law from 1st March 2024 onwards. I think for them also the information is quite limited because my understanding is Germany wants to try this out for a few years, three, four years as such. Uh, what will happen next to their families is also a bit question mark. It also brings with itself a huge financial burden. So we will have to see how it goes. I think there is a lot of improvement that needs to be done for Germany to, to move in the right direction. And certainly I think for me it looks a really huge compromise at such a it is not at fair basis and for a situation like like us existing ones who've been there in the country for so long it is hugely disappointing yeah babish you've been here in germany eight years how do the current laws affect your situation because this is something that you're dealing with at the moment aren't you with an aging parent Yes. So, I mean, my father, he sailed into the sunset of life in, in April, and, and this was completely unexpected. Since just few days before his demise, he was with me in Berlin. And my parents, they, they were living alone in Mumbai. My, like I said, my, my wife and my daughter is there with me in Berlin. My brother and his family is also there in Germany. And for us, since then, it has been a very difficult situation. It's been, of course, very stressful. My mother is all alone, and, and we need We've been thinking of figuring out a way how to best come to, to a situation and, and take the family forward. In the midst of this, of course, when we saw the new law, I think we were quite hopeful at the beginning, and but there was a lot of confusion. Uh, but I think later on, it, it really broke our hearts. Uh, when we when we identified what the actual provisions do mean to, to existing immigrants like us, it, it had an impact on us. And I'll be honest, I tried to clarify a lot by also writing to the ministries and, and writing to some of the people in the Green Party. Uh, try to see if there is a relief provision as well, uh, if there can be some benefit, because we have been, they were still in the early stages of this. But I think there was no respite. Um, and, and what we see right now is, is a difficult situation that we are in this with our family, and, and we need to find a way forward. Are you considering leaving Germany because of this? Is this something you've thought about, Bavish? Or are you trying to still think, how can you make it work? Because you've settled here, basically. You're a long-time resident. Yes, I mean, eight years is a long time. It's, it's almost one third of my life. With having plans when I came and then I started working, uh, trying to adapt myself into the country. My brother now be here as well and, and all the family members. So now it's, I've been thinking quite a bit about leaving Germany and seeing, you know, where other avenues lie. This is something that we as with the family together have been thinking quite a bit and and we'll see, but to support my mother for our family is the topmost priority. And this may definitely lead us to leaving Germany. What would you want to say to government ministers? And, and do you think they're they're listening to people and the needs of immigrants who are paying taxes here, contributing to the economy, etc.? So on the second question, I think they are not listening, which is not a good sign. I think they should listen. It's not just about bringing in talent, but also retaining existing one who has been driving the economy and who has been part of the workforce for so long. My suggestion on this would be twofold. So from the long-term perspective, it would be good that this is made uniform. We know that there is still the conservativeness that drives Germany. And from that aspect, it may be reasonable to limit the initial time period for this. Uh, so they, they are trying to limit it for four years. Maybe you open it for everybody and reduce a time period for two, three years to try and see how the long term effects are to the society and to phase this plan properly. It is not a law per se. Second thing, I think what really also needs to be done is, is some thought needs to be put on short term visas. So currently there's only Schengen visit visa provision, which just allows for three months which is too mm -hmm. short of a time, even now for a situation for like us. So, for example, my mother was there and now she's back over here. Me and my brother, we keep on and between visit. There's already financial implication, but we need to, of course, support our mother as well. And the three-month short-term visit visa really doesn't work. I think this needs to be increased, especially for people who have residence permit and who have been working to allow for a long visit visas for the family. I think this is very much done in Canada, in Australia, in USA as well, to allow one, two years visit visa, to allow a breathing period, you know, for, for such a life situation that even happens for people to, to put their feet on the ground. Right now, there is no breather. I'm living basically in two worlds at the same time.
We're coming to the end of our episode now, but first let's talk about Germany's strangest taxes, the ones that foreigners might find a little weird or surprising. And there's a few to choose from. <laughs> there really is. We could have had a whole podcast about this. Maybe we will. <laughs> we should. We'll have a special. <laughs> yeah, you. a special on German Tax taxes. special. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rachel, what do you have? So of the many weird taxes in Germany, one that particularly stands out to me is the dog tax or the Hundesteuer. Mm -hmm. And so in all of Germany's states, dog owners actually have to pay to have man's best friend in their home. In Berlin, for example, the first dog cost 120 euros per year, with additional dogs costing 180 euros per year. But it you know varies widely across the states. And if you think that you can just hide away your dog and get away with it. <laughs> um, you could be punished by a fine of up to 10,000 euros. Um, you actually have to have a special tag, um, which, yeah, the Ordnungsamt or the public order office looks out for through random checks. And in extreme cases, they can even confiscate your dog if they don't have one of those special tags. And so it is a pretty uh, strict tax for a country that claims to love dogs. I remember you wrote a story on that back in the day, Rach. I did. I love that story. I researched it heavily. Yes, people do love their dogs, right? Like there, we see so many of them yeah. um, out for walks in Berlin or whatever. I suppose that you, if you haven't paid your your dog tax, that you know, if Fido barks and alerts the Ordnungsamt. <laughs> It's an expensive I bark. That, yeah. I know. It, don't don't risk it, guys. Yeah, <laughs> you know, in most countries, the bark is about hiding drugs. Here, it's just about the dog itself. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's just the, the but what tax. It, yeah, exactly. But we don't have cat tax or anything like that. This is a you know, I, as I we know. should point out, this is a very specific. Tax yeah. for dogs, right? Yeah, cats also cause havoc. A couple of weeks ago, one caught a bird and left it in front of my door. <laughs> <laughs> are you are you advocating you. advocating for a cat tax <laughs> here, Rachel? <laughs> Hopefully, nobody from the Stoya Amt is listening to this. <laughs> I'm sure it's their favorite podcast. Obviously, <laughs> <laughs> clearly. <laughs> yeah, and Aaron, you actually have two new cats, don't you? Speaking of cats. Yes, and, that's and, true. And uh, a whole new yeah, person. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that, because uh, because our <laughs> wonderful cats, Mirian and Ludo, came over um, from the UK with my boyfriend who recently moved uh, here to Germany. And we actually did Michael's Anmeldung this week. And I never get tired of the looks that I get from people when they look at that Anmeldung form for the first time and they see the religion box. Oh, God. Right. And then <laughs> because then I have to explain what church tax is. <laughs> and yeah, you 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 list your religion and the church in question uh, in this country will get about nine percent of your income tax or eight percent if you live in either uh, Baden-Württemberg or Bavaria. Uh, so that's equivalent to about uh, 800 bucks a year on a 50,000 euro annual salary. So eight or nine percent of the tax you pay mm -hmm. um, will will go to the church. And question for you ladies, uh, just ballpark estimate. How many people do you think actually uh, pay church tax still in Germany? What's the percentage of the population you think that still pays it? I think 52 uh, percent. I might go a little bit higher because I think you get some privileges like being able to get married in a church and maybe some other things. So 70 percent. That's right. You do get uh, special advantages like to marry in a church or whatever. You you better be paying your church tax. <laughs> uh, so it's actually somewhere in the middle. It's just over 60 uh, percent wow. of people in, in Germany they still have a religion that is listed on their Anmeldung yes. and thus pay a church tax. And they know this. They can they can, with the German churches, they can check the check the baptism records and stuff. Yeah, I don't have an official religion myself. And I, of course, uh, registered this with the Bogomt. I don't have an official religion. So I am uh, of those 40 percent or so of, of people in Germany who do not pay church tax for that reason. But when I registered uh, self-employed in 2017 as a, a journalist, et cetera, et cetera, I got a letter from the uh, Bogomt saying that, that I needed to declare my religion because I had unpaid church tax. <laughs> Wait, and, as a freelancer? 
Yeah, I think they just kind of got the memo out after, you know, getting a new tax registration that I, you know, mm -hmm. and I wrote back to them with a copy of my unmolding say, it says here that there is <laughs> that there is no religion on this forum. So please do not ever bother me with this again. And well, they didn't. But <laughs> yeah, they I, really yeah. they really are thorough with that. Like when my daughter was born um, the exact same day, they asked me her religion for this form. And then just a couple days later, they asked me or they assigned us a Stoya Numa for her. So I feel like it's already, <laughs> or, yeah, exactly. So already preparation for, a, for her baptism yeah. so you can pay church tax. <laughs> yeah. Those churches, they're looking for your tax money. <laughs> There's one more thing here. Um, of course, uh, as I said before, if you don't have a religion, you don't pay it. If you want to get out of paying church tax, perhaps you were baptized as a child and you no longer practice. Um, let's say that this is the case. You will still need to renounce your your faith legally. Yeah, you get to make an appointment to renounce your faith and you get a document. Rachel's face. Too. Yeah. <laughs> she's yeah. like, she's so shocked by this. <laughs> I am. I know what this tax is, but I still can't believe yeah, it. You, yeah, yeah you fair, a, I'm shocked as well. That's, yeah, that's you, a get a, you get a document which uh, confirms that you have renounced your faith. <laughs> There's a document for everything in this country. There really is. That's serious yeah. stuff. In order to make sure that you don't get dinged with um with church tax uh you basically need to keep this uh a copy of this document, you know, around close for the rest of your life, basically, oh so goodness. that you can you can, you know, send it in as proof if anyone tries to ding you for church tax that you've renounced your faith and therefore don't have to pay it. Yeah, just add it into that filing cabinet, that bulging filing cabinet. You can have a you can have a file that says renunciation of my faith, you know, and then put it in there. <laughs> Only in Germany. Maybe maybe Switzerland too. I think they they do church tax, but <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Austria as well. These are amazing guys. I think what I might add, I think is surprising to some people is to find out that sex workers pay tax in Germany. Well, they are self-employed, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's it's very forward thinking. I think quite progressive uh, Germany is on that front. So prostitution is legal here and sex workers are required to have tax ID numbers and pay tax on all their earnings, just like every other self-employed person. So yeah, that's a nice thing about Germany. <laughs> and when you're when when you're when you're a working person, you pay your tax. <laughs> that's it. There's no messing around. You got a dog, you're in the church, you're working, pay your tax. <laughs> yeah. That's it for this week. Thank you to all our listeners. As always, we will add links in the show notes for the stories we've been talking about today. This week's panelists have been Aaron Burnett and Rachel Stern. Our guest was Bavish Upal. And our sound engineer is Reese Edwards. I'm Rachel Oxen. We hope you enjoyed listening and we'll be back again next week. Until then, take care. 